Happy Pi Day, everybody, the best holiday of the year where we get to talk some math. And in this video, it's all about pi. And specifically, I want to talk about a kind of cool formula for pi. It's the formula that pi squared divided by six is one over one plus one quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth. And in general, it can be written as the sum of terms of the form one over n squared. Now, this kind of cool identity, sometimes referred to as the Basel problem, has a whole bunch of really interesting proofs. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to prove it using the big tool of Fourier series. Now, before we jump into it, I just wanted to comment that it's really nice to have an expression for pi that can be written as a series like this, because it allows you to come up with approximations for pi. For example, you could take the sum of the first, oh, I don't know, say million terms, and that's gonna give you an approximation for, well, pi squared divided by six, but from there, pi. Okay, so I mentioned the proof is about Fourier series. If you've actually been following my Fourier series little mini playlist, then you can skip to the next timestamp, but I'm gonna give you a brief, just sort of reintroduction to Fourier series before we get into the video first. Let's start with a function like this one. It's not very discontinuous, and it's basically one or minus one. Now, I can sort of approximate that function with, well, a trigonometric expression. And you can see that at some places it's too high, at some places it's too low, but it's sort of a rough first guess. But then I can come up with a better approximation by adding to the sine of x another term, in this case, four thirds sine of three x. Three x means that it oscillates a little faster. And you can see that this approximation is a little bit better of a guess for my original discontinuous function f. I can do that same trick repeatedly. So here's one with three terms. Now I've added a sine 5x term that oscillates even faster and it's a better approximation. Keep on going and you can get better approximations, better approximations, and so forth. This one here, for example, is summing up to sine of 19 times x and it's getting to be a much, much better approximation, at least away from the discontinuities. And what's really cool about this approximation is I was just looking from zero to two pi but if this is a periodic function that repeats itself over and over again, then that approximation is really good throughout, well, this entire domain where it's periodic. So the basic idea of a Fourier series is to take some function and approximate it with trigonometric terms of different frequencies. To be a little bit more precise about it, if I have a function that's two pi periodic, then the Fourier series is this expression. It's an infinite sum of sine terms, cosine terms, and, and the one constant term out the front. Basically, you're taking different frequencies of sine, different frequencies of cosine. You're saying, can I add them all up in the way that it converges to the original function? And under some reasonable conditions for f of t, this can occur. Fourier series also comes with some formulas for what the a naught, the a n, and the b n are going to be. We've covered this in previous videos in my little Fourier series playlist, but we're not gonna use them more in this video. So now I want to show you something I haven't talked about before, which is the incredibly important Parseval's identity. This formula is gonna be the key tool that's gonna to allow us to figure out that pi squared over six formula that we're aiming for in this video. This is gonna be our major tool. And at first glance, when I look at it here, it's kind of a gnarly formula. On the left-hand side, there's some integral. On the right-hand side, there's some summation. What exactly is going on here? Now, the proof of this formula is actually a lot less interesting than trying to sort of understand what's going on geometrically. The proof basically works like this. Okay, this is what my generic expression for a Fourier series, right? That sum of cosine and sine terms is. Let me imagine I plug it into that integral on the left. So what I have is these infinite sums multiplied by another copy of these infinite sums. And because of the multiplication, there's a huge number of cross terms. And then I have to integrate out all of those terms. This might seem like a huge mess, except it turns out it just simplifies incredibly well. If you're gonna be taking an integral over its period of like sine times cosine, doesn't matter what the frequencies are gonna be here, all of those integrals are zero. And so are the integrals of sine of one frequency times sine of another, or cos of one frequency, cos of another. All of those cross terms are zero. The terms that are like cos 3t times cos 3t, those will survive, and that's what leaves me those coefficients. So I'll leave all the algebra to actually do those integrals as a, an exercise for all of you in the comments. But save it to say, you can just plug this in, and as long as you're a little bit careful about what's happening with infinite series, then indeed this formula just pops out. 
Okay, fine, but, but what does it mean? That's the interesting part. Now, what I really want to do is interpret this identity as sort of a generalization of just good old Pythagoras. How does that work? I want to consider all functions of some class, maybe piecewise continuous functions that are 2 pi periodic on some particular interval. Then there is a funky way to take a product of two functions of this form, something that we call an inner product in math, a way that you take one function and another function, you smash them together to spit out a real number. The idea is you just take this particular integral, 1 over pi, the integral from negative pi up to pi of f of t, g of t, dt. So it takes two functions as inputs and it spits out a real number. This inner product should seem vaguely familiar to other products that we might have seen. For example, in linear algebra we have the dot product that takes in two vectors u and v, also spits out a real number, and it basically does it by multiply the first two components, multiply the second two components, and so on. These two inner products obey a similar set of rules for inner products, but, but more importantly, they're very analogous. An integral, after all, is sort of a continuous sum. So the fact that one's a sum and one's an integral, it's sort of a, a continuous version of the other. And then likewise, if you look at what's happening in the dot product, you're multiplying the first two components. Well, in the integral, you're multiplying the two functions at one specific value of t, then adding up the contribution at another value of t, and so on. So I just want to have that metaphor in your mind. And now let's go and remind ourselves about good old Pythagoras. Then this triangle is going to obey Pythagoras as we all know. c squared is a squared plus b squared. I'm going to recast this in the language of vectors. So if I'm going to go and put up uh, my coordinate system, I imagine there being a vector from the origin whose tip is going to be at the point a, b. Then the dot product with itself is just going to be the same thing as the square of the length. u dot u is just a squared plus b squared. So the point is, the inner product with itself is analogous to a sort of length squared of this diagonal, and that works when we're talking about a right triangle where the, the x component and the y component are orthogonal to each other. Now, if you haven't seen this before, it's kind of interesting. Pythagoras in two dimension generalizes almost trivially to Pythagoras in three dimensions. Imagine some point in three dimensions, it's got an a and a b and a c as its x, y, and z coordinates. Then I can figure out what d squared is. First I project down into the xy plane, which creates this little triangle here, and we can use two-dimensional Pythagoras. The hypotenuse is, you know, square root of a squared plus b squared. And then if I want to figure out what the d squared is, well, I have a second triangle appearing. This is the triangle that has sides d, c, and square root of a squared plus b squared. By Pythagoras again, it's the square of the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So this is a generalized Pythagoras to three dimensions. And indeed, if I put up the vector formative again, I could rewrite this as saying just u dot u. So here's the point. When you have this sort of orthogonal basis, as our fancy linear algebra term for thinking of x, y, and z directions all being orthogonal, then the dot product of a vector with itself, you can just write out in this very simple way with Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared plus c squared, the sum of the different components squared. So let's go back to Parseval's identity. What do I consider that thing on the left? Well, the integral of f of x squared is just like the inner product of f with itself. And what we just sort of argued was that the inner product of f with itself is a little bit like just saying the length squared of that diagonal. So sort of intuitively, this whole expression on the left is a little bit like saying the length squared of my original function f of x length interpreted in this particular context with this particular inner product. And on the right hand side I have the squares of the different components. And basically what's going on here is I imagine the sine and the cosine terms are sort of like an orthogonal basis where you go different amounts in this orthogonal basis. And then just as we saw with Pythagoras it's just sort of a squared plus b squared but now because it's this infinite series becomes a sum of a n squared plus b n squared. And the constant sticks out the front with the weird divided by 2 over it. Don't worry about it for the purpose of this video. And just to be clear, I brush very quickly through that geometric intuition here. I have an entire video on the geometric intuition of the Fourier series, so I definitely check that down in the playlist if, if you're interested in more going in that direction. Okay, so we are finally ready to actually prove our claim now that we've justified this Parseval's identity, at least loosely justified it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make use of this identity 
for the specific function f of x is equal to x. And I'm going to take that on a particular integral of the integral minus pi to pi. So I have a left-hand side and a right-hand side of Parseval's identity, and I want to plug this specific f into both of them. And the first thing I'm going to note is I know what the Fourier series for f of x equal to x is. I hope that's going to be the last time I refer to one of my previous videos, but I really have done this entire example before, and I've computed out exactly what those coefficients are. So we know them. The bn's, by the way, the, the cosine terms are all zero, there's no constant term. This is it. And if I look at that an, I know I want an an squared in Parseval's identity, so all that minus one stuff goes away. I can substitute it in, and it's just going to be four divided by n squared. That is my series. Already looking a little bit closer to where we're trying to go. Good stuff. Now I have to do the other side. I have to do the left-hand side. I have to go and say, well, hold on. I can do an integral where f of x is equal to x. It's just a straightforward integral that we could do immediately in first-year calculus. Take that integral. It's x cubed divided by 3. Evaluate it between pi and minus pi. And what do we get? 2 pi squared divided by 3. The left-hand side was easy. So all I have to do is plug that in. I see that I have a 4 on the right-hand side, I'll divide out by that 4, and I finally get the formula I wanted, pi squared divided by 6 is the sum from 1 to infinity of 1 divided by n squared. Kind of a cool formula. Alright, I hope you enjoyed my Pi Day video. Give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm, check out the merch, the link is down in the description, and we'll do some more math in the next video.